already questioned. Remember, I have chocolate. state 
And this inner product, well, what would it be? Well, I'm going to say that it's equal to integral by double prime, and I'm going to split this into e to the minus i epsilon integral pi squared over 2 d cubed x pi prime pi prime e to the minus i epsilon v of 5 d cubed x pi prime and then d pi. So we're integrating over a complete set of pi states and these pi states are the states that are eigenstates of the conjugate momentum operator uh, at time zero. These are a complete set of eigenstates. And the inner product phi prime pi prime is a normalization factor that I'll call f or something, f for fudge factor. Um, e to the i integral pi prime of x pi prime of x d cubed x. Do ask questions, short ones available. Second exponential net equation, shouldn't it? Yes, an integral sign. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Is that what they're called? Integral signs? Huh? Is that, that what you meant? Yeah. But is it oh, and I, I forgot to tell you what V is. Yeah. Um, you know something All no. right. Our Hamiltonian here <laughs> is going to be pi squared over 2 plus V of 5. And what I mean by this is pi squared over 2 plus grad phi squared over 2 plus a half m squared phi squared plus some p of phi if we have a self-interaction. Okay. So that's how I'm thinking of it. So we're doing a sort of fairly general case for a scalar field, and of course the, the funny thing is that no one's observed a particle, well, possibly now at uh, the LHC for the first time we've seen a, we may have seen a uh, fundamental scale particle. Um, the fact that all the particles, the other particles that we've seen have had spin one half or spin one, um, whereas in the theory we're talking about, the simplest case doesn't appear. That's kind of a hint that maybe we're looking at things wrong. Um, so I'm going to solve that mystery. Um, certainly not in class. Anyway, so what is this? This then is f squared, the fudge factor squared. Um, this this eigen, is an eigenstate of this field operator because it's just v of phi. So we have e to the minus i epsilon integral v of phi prime d cubed x. That comes right out. And then what's left is the inner product of this with phi prime, phi prime with this, and this is an eigenstate of pi, so you get pi prime squared. And so what we have then is e to the minus i epsilon pi prime squared over 2 d cubed x. Well, never mind the d cubed x so, so quickly. <coughs> plus i pi prime, phi prime, phi double prime, minus phi prime, all that d cubed x. 
um, and then d pi prime. And now you know how to do these Gaussian integrals, so you're not would be wouldn't be surprised if this is some other fudge factor f prime e to the i epsilon integral a half phi dot squared, where phi dot is this thing, and it's phi dot prime squared, and then minus v of phi prime. So that's what this this in a product is phi double prime e minus i epsilon h prime prime. It is some overall scale factor that, in fact, is the right scale factor to pro appropriately normalize the path integral over the fields. Um, and it, it's then multiplied by the space factor. And um, so if we put together many of these factors, you see what's going to happen. This is a little bit of the action. In other words, the action is phi dot squared over 2 minus the, the potential part. This is a little bit of the action. And uh, so when we put the whole thing together, what we have is phi double prime e to the minus 2it h phi prime. And I'm thinking now of t as some macroscopic time. And so we're putting together 2t over epsilon factors. Factors, in other words, uh, 2t over epsilon, things like this. then what we have is an integral from phi prime to phi double prime, e to the i integral, one half phi dot squared of x minus v of phi of x. And now it's deep, I'm thinking of this as d fourth x because I'm thinking of this time this 2t goes from minus t to plus t, and I'm thinking of a limit, t goes to infinity. So we're integrating over all of time, all of uh, space. And this is then the full action. So this is integral phi prime, phi double prime, e to the i s of phi, t phi. So that's, that's the very na nice formula that you get. And the marvelous thing is that you, we could have started out with uh, a much more physical theory like electrodynamics, and we would have gotten eventually something very much like this. So are there any questions or corrections? Yeah. In the, is there an integral sign missing if you mark the x matrix? I'm sorry, say it again. Is there an integral sign missing? Probably. Uh, where do you think it's missing? Uh, on the right hand side of the left board. On like the kind of third Right line. here. Yeah, right there. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. That's as I've said to you many times, whenever my left hand is down I had a visitor this uh, last couple of days, somebody I went to college with, somebody went to college with me, and he showed up with his wife unexpectedly. Um, so I'm a little bit, I'm less well rested. Actually, I have a question. Yes. Um, so the scalar fields we're considering in this case are real, right? Are, are these real scalar the fields? Field, yes, the scalar field is real, yes. So if this were a, com mission. If this were a complex field, would um, that, so that identity you wrote, phi pi inner product, 
Would there need to be a complex conjugate sign on that integral? Let me, uh, let's, let's work it out. It might be useful to work it out. I can't answer on the fly. Let's do it correctly. A complex field is really two real fields. So this thing would be phi 1, pi 1 plus phi 2, pi 2. That's what it actually would be. Okay? And um, in other words, that's what this inner product would be. And so I, so let's see, how would we write this in terms of a complex, uh, if we had a, um, a field phi as 1 over root 2, phi 1 plus i phi 2, sorry for changing the font, uh, pi as 1 over root 2, and I am not sure whether pi comes in with a plus or a minus sign, so let's do this. Okay. Um, so wait, pi is an individual thing, not just some arbitrary function that we choose? Pi is the pi is the momentum conjugate to phi. Oh, oh I see. So for your transform pi, you get pi. Say that again. For your transform phi, you get pi. Is it? No, 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 no. It's like this. Good question. I'll give you your chocolate in a moment. If we set h bar equal to one, so we don't plug the formulas, q p is i. I see. I see. All right. All right. So then we go from that to phi of x, let us say, and 0, pi of y and 0, that commutator is i delta of x minus y. And what I should have said here is kl is i delta kl. Okay, the analog of this is this. And that's what we're talking about here. Now, the the thing that we want, I mean, there's one way of, if you choose the right sign here, this should work out nicely, and the five pi should work out nicely. And what would we want? We'd want I think then it's the minus sign. We have a minus sign here, then we see we have five pi would give us um, an I delta here and an I delta there. Um, and then we could, how would we write this? Would we, let us, let us try to write it this way. Let us, let's suppose we just write it as phi pi, hmm. this isn't going to be so good because we're going to have cross terms. Um, uh, anyway, there's a standard way of doing this that that turns phi pi into this in a quite nice way. But at the moment, I'm not seeing what it is because I'm seeing, I'm having trouble getting rid of the cross terms. Um, Do the cross terms collect into into commutators? Hmm? When, you, when you take the cross terms, do they sort of collect into like commutators between, like say, phi 1 and pi 2 and phi 2 and pi 1? Or, well, I, I think it works here. Uh, what I'm saying is up here it's not working for me. But, all right, I, I thought it was easy for me to do this on the fly. It's not. Um, so, um, but in, in any event, to tell you, I mean, the, instead of using the complex notation, just thinking of the two, of the complex fields, two real fields, then it would be phi 1, uh, Phi, phi 1 pi 1 plus phi 2 pi 2. Mm -hmm. Now, how you express that in terms of phi and pi, I'm not sure. Okay. 
and uh, I'm sorry I can't do it on the fly. I'll think about it. And in fact, if you want, come by my office. Uh, and those interested can come down to my office after class and like, trash it out. But I think I should just go on with what I've actually prepared. In this inner product, why is it again that we're integrating over all time? Well, we put in, in order to get this, we had to put in this uh, 2t over epsilon factors. And so this is, I'm just taking the limit, t goes to infinity, and so it's going from minus t to plus t. That's what this e to the minus 2it is. And so I'm just saying, well, um, we're taking the limit, t goes to infinity. And I've, oh, here we are, okay. And so this is, of course, just a lovely formula. And um, so now let's, let's talk about a Heisenberg field. Well, it's going to be e to the i t h phi of x zero e to the minus i t h. And now the time ordered product of two of these what will it be? Well it will be theta of x10 minus x20 phi of x1 phi of x2 plus theta of x20 minus x10 phi of x Now, what we're going to do is we're going to sandwich this between two factors of e to the minus i t h, because remember, what generates this lovely path integral is basically e to the minus i t h. And so here then we're going to have e to the minus i t h, time ordered product, phi of x1, phi of x2, e to the minus i t h. And what will this be? Well, remember, phi of x1 looks like this, so there's going to be an x10 there. So this will be e to the minus i t from this term, but then a plus i x10. So that means this will be t minus, and I wrote it as t1. In other words, t1 is x10. T2 is x20. Um, question. Should one of these e to the ITHs be positive rather than negative? Give me that again. One of these e to the negative ITH, should the one on the left be positive or something? It's positive. Below that. You mean this one? Yes. No, it's stick. Um, good question. Worthy of a chocolate. But um, I'm sandwiching, sandwiching it between two factors of e to the minus i t h, and those t, that t is going to be this big t. The e to the plus i t here is from the t one or x one zero. This one, okay. And so let me just. Let me write the rest of this down. It's not hard, but it, it does have some detail in it. Okay, so this, this is an important formula. So the e to the minus i t h is sitting still on the left right, and e to the minus i t h is still on the left, and then we have the then we have the factors of e to the i t1 or t2 that come from here. For example, this would be t1 
like that. And that shows up here, and then the same thing with for T2 shows up here, and so we get this expression. And so now you see what, you, what you've got here is T is U, so T minus T1 is one factor. This will be, this will generate a lot of E to the IS. And then we'll have a field operator, we'll have some more E to the IS, another field operator, more E to the IS. And so the inner product then of phi double prime e to the minus i t h time ordered product phi of x1 phi of x2 e to the minus i t h phi prime then is an integral of phi prime to phi double prime phi of x1 phi of x2 the I S phi D phi. And we're integrating here over fields that go from the, that at time minus T of phi prime as function of space. And positive, positive far into the future are phi double prime of X. And for each phi, now that you see phi of x1 is just the value of the field at the space time point x1, and then here the space time point x2, and we're integrating over all the fields. And there's an obvious generalization of this. said to you before, um, these functions, these eigenstates of the field operator are states of infinite energy because, you know, after all, uh, they're states where the field is sharp and consequently the conjugate momentum is fuzzy and the conjugate momentum uh, occurs in the Hamiltonian over here, pi squared. Here, maybe throw this around just so that you can see. So this pi squared means, this pi squared, the mean value of pi squared in a field that's an eigenstate, in a state that's an eigenstate of the uh, field operator, is then, uh, infinite, pi squared is infinite, and consequently these are states of infinite energy. And the same thing in general is typically true of eigenstates of the um, momentum operator. So what we, what we're, so these are mathematically useful, but when we're trying to do physics, we want states that are of low energy. And um, so we in particular like the ground state of the theory. And so to find that, we imagine that this is the ground state, and then it's in a product e to the minus 2i th phi prime phi prime vacuum d phi double prime d phi prime what will this be? Well this is in fact just 
ground state e to the minus 2i t h ground state. Okay, because I've just put in a complete set of eigenstates of the field operator. This is the identity operator. This is the identity operator when we integrate over all the fields. And uh, so I'm just computing this. And this, in fact, is a number. This is a normalized state. And so, and it's an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So this is e to the minus 2i e0 t. It's just a phase factor with a particular value. On the other hand, we know what this is. This is a certain path integral. So this is equal to an integral, the wave function of the vacuum, or the complex conjugate of it, a path integral, and let me write it down nicely, e to the i, the action functional, the wave function of the, bank, of the ground state, and now we have to integrate d phi, d phi, well, d phi double prime, d phi prime, d phi. The d phi is to do, is for this, and the, and the d phi prime and d phi double prime are these guys. All right, so it's, it's worth looking at that then for a moment and appreciating that that's what we have. And if instead we take this matrix element and integrate it. So we have zero by double prime by double prime e to the minus i t h time ordered product. Let me just write it as phi one dot 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 phi n e to the minus i t h phi prime phi prime vacuum. Well, what is this going to be? Well, this is just the identity operator. This is going to pull out an e to the minus 2i. So this is e to the minus 2i e0t times the value of the ground state of phi of x1 dot 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 phi of x n. And on the other hand, this thing is equal to an integral, 0 phi double prime, e to the i s of phi, phi 1 dot 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 phi n. And now phi prime 0. And now d phi prime, d phi double prime. So we have two expressions. This integral here gives e to the minus 2i e0t times the mean value in the ground state of the theory of a time ordered product of field operators. On the other hand, an integral without the fields gives us simply e to the minus 2i e0t. So now I'm going to take the ratio of these. And the ratio of the base factor of the resulting the energy of the ground state is going to cancel. Also, all of those normalizing factors that are actually meaningful in that they appropriately normalize the integrals over the Path integrals over all the fields, but be that as it may, they cancel when you take the ratio. All right, so what we get then is the time ordered product of the field out there. is a ratio of path integrals and it's 
integral of zero phi double prime phi of x1 phi of x n phi prime zero. Well, certainly e to the i s to phi. And I'm just going to write that as d phi. I'm going to absorb the integrations over the phi prime and phi double prime. <coughs> And then it's the ratio of that to the integral e to the i s of phi e phi. So now the, the phase factors yeah. cancel. Oh. Whoops, whoops, whoops. I left out something. And if you want for completeness, all right. D5 run, D5 double four. But the, this is an integral over functions of space time. The D5 prime and the D5 double prime are integrals over functions of space. Mm. All right, so, wow, it's only 6.06. I see. I thought I had almost finished the lecture. I guess I'm a little tired. Um, well, it's story time. Well, it's not, it's not really story time. Um, <laughs> a lot of room for story time. All right, then I'll tell you, all right, I'll tell you another story of this, um, this group of very smart people uh, who were assembled in Washington in, um, rather temporary quarters, actually. And at the end of World War II, the thing was disbanded. And then, when people started to go nuts in this country about communism, um, they reconstituted this as the CIA. Previously, it had been called something else, and I, I forget what it is. The OSS or something? Yeah, I think it's called the OSS. It will come to me. Anyway. If you just Google forerunner of the CIA, you'll find out what it is. Anyway, um, so the, another scheme they, they constructed, that they invented, that actually sort of worked, was exploding coal. I didn't tell you about exploding coal? Right. Well, Germany was under such stress at this time that, um, the, that they were actually, um, and locomotives ran on coal in those days. And, um, you know, it's like 41, 42. And they were running out of coal in Germany. So as the, so anytime they saw a spare coal, along the railroad tracks, somebody would be assigned the duty of picking it up and assembling it and using it, adding it to the coal stock for the locomotives. What do you mean by spare coal along the railroad tracks? People just dumping it out on the side or something? No, it, it, you know, the, the train goes along, bump, bump, bump along, yeah. the, and some few pieces come it's out, and, or it, it, it stops at a place and gets a load of coal, and the coal doesn't all go in, it spills to some extent. I mean, if you, I, I think I remember as when I was a boy, um, the trains was, were running on coal. And um, in fact, I was terribly disappointed when they went to, um, this is in New York, and you would take the train sometime from New York City to Boston and back. And the trains were originally steam engines running on coal, and it was really romantic. You see the steam come up, and it was really quite nice. Then um, they switched to electric and diesel, and there was no drama at all, no, no visual effects, and I was just so disappointed. Um, <laughs> I'm just going on too long. Now, let me try to finish the story. So what happened? They, that what they decided was that if they dropped coal that had um, 
that were actually the blackened pieces of maybe small pieces of dynamite or some other kind of explosive. Um, not, you know, not something that was really super dangerous, but just enough to really startle people and, you know, frighten people. They, so they, they would fly over, when, when they come back from bombing Germany, on the way back, they just sort of shovel some of this explosive coal out the, out the bomb bay doors as they flew over the railroad tracks. And then the Germans would pick it up thinking it was coal, and they started to well, shovel it in with the normal coal, and the damn stuff would explode and uh, scare the hell out of the engineer or the fireman or whatever, whatever you call the guy who shoved the coal into the, into the engine, into the, you know, I guess it was the engine. And the idea wasn't to kill the engineers. The idea was that the engineer would take a shovel of coal and look at it and see if he could identify a piece of coal that was exploding coal so he'd throw it out and not throw it in because when it exploded, it probably blew some of the lit coal out of the oven and, you know, he could get burned. And uh, so this, so each time he shoveled, there was a hesitation. And the idea was that there was enough hesitation that it would slow down the trains. And apparently it worked. Um, and uh, so that was one of the successes of the, let us call it the OSS. I think that's the name. Office of Strategic Services or Secret Services. I'll, I'll, uh, next time I'll tell you another story. Okay, so we're at a point now, but of course you might worry. Uh, we've got these things, and um, so this formula on the right hand side no longer looks so really nice. Yeah, are there any questions? Okay, but last time we figured out for the case of a free field theory what, the, what these functions were. And then, in fact, we computed them. Phi prime zero for uh, a free field theory is a normalization factor, which of course cancel here. And then e to the minus one half integral phi tilde prime of p absolute value squared the square root of p squared plus m squared d cubed p. So we have a formula for this. All right. Now, um, so let's, for the moment, do have, have a sort of schizophrenic attitude here. For S, we'll, we'll think about S as being the action of an interacting field theory. But we're going to be, at least initially, considering this to be the ground state of the free field theory. Okay. Um, but frankly, this isn't going to make that much difference because when people do the, well, let me show you how this goes in the case of the, the free field theory. And, um, in fact, actually, so as not to burn you with schizophren temporary schizophrenia, I'm going to just do the free field theory to start with. This is the ground state of the free field theory. So our theory is going to be h0 is integral a half pi squared plus a half grad phi squared plus a half m squared phi squared d That's going to be our, our, Hamilton, our Hamiltonian. And the fields are going to be involved this way, phi of x and t is e to the i t h0 phi of x zero e to the minus of t h zero. Okay. And we'll have this formula. Okay. Um, 
What's the action? Well, the action itself has a nice form. Let me first write it nominal with this, well, in the sort of symbol notation, phi dot squared minus squared phi squared minus m squared phi squared. So that's our action. But of course, the time derivative minus the space derivative is a four vector. And so this thing is one half and now <coughs> minus d a phi d upper a phi minus m squared phi squared. So let me explain the notation a little bit. Um, d a phi is just a normal derivative. Phi dot comma grad. D A phi is minus phi dot grad. Now Z would instead put the minus sign here rather than there. And but this exactly means that because the minus sign here cancels this minus sign, and so we get phi dot squared with the plus sign. On the other hand, there isn't any minus sign in the three space, spatial derivatives, so this thing just gives us, this minus sign is actually, there's no other minus sign. So that's how the, that's the relativistic notation. And as I said, z would write it this way. da phi is still phi dot grad phi, but d upper a phi sub z is um, phi dot minus plus. Okay. And now we're going to have our usual Fourier transforms. Phi tilde of p is an integral e to the minus i p x phi of x for x. And by px, what I mean is p vector x vector minus et. And phi of x then is e to the i px by tilde of p d for p over and now, as usual, if you've got an expression that only involves derivatives um, and is quadratic, the, um, the Fourier representation throws you into something that uh, is algebraic, in this case a quadratic form, and so the expression then for the action is S0. Zero. zero means that it's, um, that we don't have any interaction. So S0 of phi is minus a half integral phi tilde of p squared. And then p squared plus m squared p fourth p over p pi to the fourth. Now, one of the nice things about Euclidean, Euclidean space is you always knew where you were. If you see p squared, you, you, you can be sure that it's positive. Here in Minkowski space, this is space <coughs> part minus time part. This can be positive or negative. Now, 
by the way, in going from here to there, of course, you, you can do it in various ways, but um, one way of doing it is to realize that phi is real. You have to write phi twice. So you write it this way once, and then the other time you write it as a complex conjugate of this, because phi is real, so complex conjugating it doesn't change anything. So you have a minus sign and a complex conjugate sign. And then you have e to the i px, e to the minus i px, that gives you a delta function. And so you get this expression. That's perhaps the easiest way of doing it. OK, so we remember that we have this expression here. And so this expression contributes something extra to the path integral. In other words, we're going to have these extra factors. So in other words, we have um, 5 prime 0, 0 5 double prime. I probably should have written the opposite one. So 5 double prime 0. <coughs> now I wrote it backwards. So five prime zero makes sense. And then this one is zero by double prime. And then we have the factor e to the i s zero of phi. So these are the factors that occur here. This one, this one, and that one. And in the denominator, this one, this one, and that one. And this looks like a delta, it's really an S. And for the case of S0, it's this. Okay, so what will this be? Well, this will be e to the i S0 of phi, but there'll be an extra term. And it'll be this minus a half. It'll be n squared. And then e to the minus one half um, integral dqp over two pi cubed square root of p squared plus m squared, and that's three vector p. the i epsilon in the uh, Feynman propagator for uh, ordinary space times post Euclidean space time. And by the way, the, the derivation I'm giving you of this i epsilon rule is, is something I heard from, I learned from Weinberg and um, in this book, uh, volume one. Uh, okay, so where are we now? So, what's the change in the action? The change in the action, delta S0 of phi, would be I over 2. The I over 2 is that we're going to have e to the I here. So the i times the i is going to give the minus 1 half. Square root of p squared plus m squared by tilde prime of p. And in fact, what, we, what we're doing here, of course, is we're integrating over all fields that go from phi prime at minus p 
to find double prime at plus t. So we can call this thing uh, phi <coughs> without a prime p t squared plus phi tilde of p minus t squared like that. And then d q p over 2 pi q. So this is the extra term in the action due to these two terms here. This one, that one, and then the bottom, this one, and that one. Okay, well, there's a trick, a, a sort of magic identity that I've only seen in Weinberg's book. I haven't seen anywhere else. And um, it looks like this. It's the limit epsilon goes to zero plus of epsilon times an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity f of t e to the minus epsilon absolute value of t dt. All right. I'm going to, um, I'm not going to give you a derivation of that. I don't have one here in my notes. And I may assign it as a homework problem. Um, but uh, in any event, let's just assume that that's a correct mathematical identity. That allows us to write the change in the action in a certain form that's going to be convenient. Namely, it's the limit epsilon goes to zero plus. Zero plus means it's going to zero from positive uh, positive values. I epsilon over two integral square root of p squared plus m squared integral minus infinity plus infinity by tilde of p and t e to the minus epsilon absolute value of t dt dqp to pi q. So in other words, we get these two values, we rewrite it and this way so that we have an integral over time and momentum. On the other hand, if we're taking the limit epsilon goes to zero, then we can actually replace this factor by one. So there we are. And now what is this? Well, this is positive. That's surely positive. So this is just I epsilon, essentially. Um, in other words, the action now, S0, S0 of V plus delta <coughs> S0 of V is now what? It's this thing and then an i epsilon here. And because of the minus sign there, it's going to be a minus i epsilon. So it's going to look like this. Minus one half integral by tilde of p absolute value squared p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon square root of p squared plus m squared. Whereas this is three vector p squared. e fourth p over two pi to the fourth. Um,
suppose it's okay, but I'm just a little bit puzzled that we've gone from this to that. But I suppose it's okay. In fact, it may just be a standard Fourier transform relation. So let's, let's just go with this. In any event, what we're going to do now is say the limit of epsilon going to zero, we can forget about the square root because the square root is just positive. We're taking the limit epsilon goes to zero anyway. <coughs> and so, so our formula then for the time order product, at least for the discrete field theory, change yeah. in the action? Yeah. Okay. The change in the action is to represent these factors out in front, the 0, 5 prime and 0, 5 double prime. These factors are a normalization factor times an exponential. In fact, for the free field theory, they're exactly this. On the other hand, they don't really matter that much because they're, they just refer to the field in the far past and the far future. Mm -hmm. And in any case, it's a damped exponential. And so the whole effect of it is just to replay, is just to change p squared plus m squared to p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. That's the, the net effect of all that is just that. Especially when you have a ratio of path integrals so that the things cancel. Did I give you your chocolate or did I forget? I forgot. Okay, so now we're going to do this business with the e to the i j pi. So we're going to define z zero of j as ground state time ordered product e to the i integral j of x b of x b four of x. And we're still with the free theory now. That's what the zero on j means. But the this, huh? The what theory? The free theory, the quadratic theory. Oh, right. In other words, the one we understand. 
Okay. But this, of course, is a special case of that, in a sense. And so, we can write this as a ratio, integral, e to the i integral, j of x, y of x, e to the x, plus i, s0 of phi and epsilon, divided by a d phi, divided by the integral e to the i, s0 of phi and epsilon, d phi. And now we're integrating over all functions of space-time, uh, all fields. Now, what is z0 of a zero current? One, yes. I guess that's deserves a trouble. Um, and now I'm going to absorb this term into the action. So I'm going to say, I don't know whether this was an intelligent notation or not, but the one I used. This modified action is equal to minus a half integral by tilde of p, absolute value squared. So this is the Fourier transform of the field times p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon minus j star tilde of P, the Fourier transform complex conjugate current, really charge density, by tilde, well, it's not even charge, anyway, density, we call it a current, by tilde star of P, J tilde of P, One more bracket, d fourth p over two pi to four. Okay, so that's um, what I'm calling this modified, uh, doubly modified action. Sorry. What? Yes. What is that? Um, J tilde of x. I'm not really sure what the second term is. Uh, goes this term? Yeah, that's right. What is that? It's J is the Fourier J star J tilde is the Fourier transform <coughs> of J. This right, what's happening after that little star or x sort of? Phi tilde of P. No no no. Between the J tilde and the of P. Complex conjugate. That means what's what's J star? This thing? Yeah. yeah. Well that's complex country. No, I see. And that's just J at minus P. Yeah, that's another way of saying it. Z stays in X space and says, well, well, I just erased what I need. But one way of thinking about this is you write the action with the I epsilon and the J and so forth. You write it as um, 
And instead of p squared and m squared and so forth, we write it as, as uh, derivatives of the field. And then you have j phi, and you stay in position space. And then you say, well, this is just a Gaussian integral. And the derivatives are sort of a matrix. And so you use that Gaussian integral formula that's actually on page two of chapter 16. And you get the answer that I'm about to get. I think it's simpler to do what I'm doing, though. I think it's much simpler. So I'm letting psi tilde of P equal phi tilde of P minus J tilde of P divided by P squared plus M squared minus I epsilon. Now we're going to substitute into that formula there. We're going to replace phi by psi. So in other words, phi tilde is going to be psi tilde plus j tilde over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And so that means that S0 of phi epsilon j is minus a half integral. Well, the psi squared terms are going to... Right, I think I should do this for you in, in complete detail. So let's do it. Um, psi tilde star plus j tilde star over p squared plus m squared plus i epsilon. The next term is p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And now here, we would have uh, psi tilde plus j tilde over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And then we have minus j tilde star phi tilde, phi tilde is psi tilde plus j tilde over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And then the other one is minus j psi tilde plus j star, j tilde star over p squared plus m squared plus i epsilon. Okay, so these are all of the terms, and all that then gets multiplied by d4 to p over 2 pi to 4. Some huge bracket here. Is that a Jane tilde? Do that again? I'm going to stop. I'm going to get a tilde on top of the J. That one? psi tilde absolute value squared times p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And all right, well, let's see the various uh, terms that we're going to get. We're going to get plus <coughs> j tilde star psi tilde, and we're going to have p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon over p squared plus m squared plus i epsilon. And um, we're going to have psi tilde star j tilde p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And um, 
then we have minus g tilde psi tilde star. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Let me think about making this rigorous, but let us say that here, um, I think we can ignore the i epsilons in these terms, and then this and this cancel that and that. Down here, this is legitimately canceled back, and we get this term with the correct i epsilon. Yeah, I think this is all right. 